press live in three, two, one. And hello, welcome back to uh, Spark 21, uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland Regional Conference. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. We hope you enjoy this. Uh, this is our discussion on features and entertainment riding with Mike McGraw, uh, Mike McGraw Brian, and hello. Esther McCarthy. Um, Esther is just uh, will be here. Hopefully, she'll be here in a few minutes. But um, for, for starters, uh, Mike, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Mike. Uh, I am a features writer. Uh, currently working at the features desk at the Irish Examiner, as well as in a freelance capacity at its sister paper, The Echo. Uh, aside from those, I am a, an, a, a these days infrequent contributor at present because of the circumstances to Nylor9.com, as well as an occasional um, features radio contributor to Dublin Digital Radio out of Dublin uh, in all places. Um, my work in the Irish Examiner tends to be a mixture of writing, social media uh, oversight, uh, content creation, as well as content management, working with back-end systems to sub edit and uh, set content to be out on time, uh, as well as doing various things like uh, managing the front end of the website and so forth. So uh, a bit of a, a, a bit of a jack of all trades role inside in the examiner. Um, so it's 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 a little bit of a challenge, but so far it's been a challenge. Been it's been a challenge worth taking on rather. Hello. Uh, perfect. Sorry. Um, so uh, hello there. Oh. And here's Esther, in, just waiting in the, um, one sec. Oh, technology, the bane of our existence. <laughs> you, can, you can't live with it, but you, well, you have to live with it because we're stuck. Uh, <laughs> we don't yeah. have any other choice. Uh, one so sec. we're all working. I think they're being shy. <laughs> Hello, Esther. Here we go. Hello, Esther. Can you hear us? One, two. Been a bit funny, isn't it? We're live, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no, one sec. <laughs> Never goes right, you any life. <laughs> no. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, Esther. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah we can hear you live and clear. Great. <laughs> really sorry I'm late, guys. Um, fine. My computer is at the year in stage of the pandemic. Oh, no. Nice. <laughs> yeah. so it just Most takes an up. age for every simple action to to go through. So waiting Most for like a delivery of the at this stage. <laughs> True. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's it, it like it's fine. You're just arriving fast and the late, you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> never, Welcome never fashionable. <laughs> well, uh, do you want to quickly introduce yourself, Esther? Yeah, and apologies again, guys. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Oh, um, you're fine. But yeah, I'm uh, Esther McCarthy. I uh, graduated from College of Commerce in Rathmines in uh, the early nineties, and um, I worked in Sunday World for many years. And then about six years ago, I decided to go freelance because journalism wasn't a torrid enough place as it was. Um, so I've been writing for various publications since then. Um, I know the focus is on entertainment and features here. So I would do stuff, I would still do stuff for Sunday World. I would do a lot of feature writing and um, arts writing for the Irish Examiner. And then I write for a trade publication, uh, a film trade publication called Screen International, um, which is kind of, I suppose, the um, the European version of Variety, say, or the Hollywood Reporter. Um, so that that's the kind of the big trade publication for the film industry in this part of the world. And then I'm all, I'm also on fortunate to be on Moncrief movies and booze every Friday as well where we get paid to have the crack oh I'd love to be a, be paid to, to uh, just have the crack uh, yeah. I do this I do this for, I do this free of charge though <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah we're just going to kick off now um, so if any during this panel, um, if anyone has any questions, of course, just uh, press the um, the raise hand icon and we'll, we'll let you in or post it into the chat and you can ask your questions. But to start, I guess, um, 
I guess the best thing to do would be to go to, you know, go back to the beginning. It's because a lot of, like, I mean, pretty much everyone here are either just starting out their career as a, like, in the industry or are interested in getting involved in the industry. So I guess uh, the first question would be, uh, I would ask would be, uh, could you tell us a little more about how you got started in the early days of your career in the industry? Um, uh, would you want to start, Esther? Okay, yeah. I, I, so I had to repeat my leaving search, first of all, I suppose is what I would start with. Um, because journalism, I know it's probably hard to believe now, but journalism courses in the eight, you know early 90s were as rare as hen's teeth in Ireland. There was um, the College of Commerce course in Rat Mines, which you guys would know as Bishop Street, I guess, um, DCU and Bishop Street. Uh, they had a course, but they only took about 25, 26 people. And it was points based, but it was also interview based. Um, there was a couple of media courses. There was a, good, uh, a course in Glasnevin, DCU as well. I think it's still there. But that was kind of it. Like private courses weren't an option and um, they wouldn't have been an option for me financially anyway. Uh, so I didn't quite get the points involved the first time out. Uh, so I had to go back and just get that, a couple of extra points. Um, to get a shot at Rath Mines. I'd also applied for an arts degree in uh, UCC because I wasn't going to go back and, and do the points race again. Uh, and I was also thinking about te teaching at that point. But I got up to Dublin and I got the um, inter I got to the interview stage and basically I was kind of running out of options at that stage. So I really went for it and, and did the hard sell and got in, fortunately. The great thing about Rath Mines, I think, at that time, um, now, now the um, DCU is uh, that you got uh, a work placement at the end of your first year, and really there were so few journalists coming out, graduates coming out at, at that point that newspapers used it as an employment line, really. So you could only mess it up to not get work directly as a result of the course, which was the huge benefit to it and, and why I wanted to to do it. In fact. We were so successful at getting employed at the end of that work placement that they had to change the work placement to the end of second year because, because we were like going in for two hours and then heading off to do a story or write a feature and stuff like that. So it became too successful for and I actually threatened the, um, the second year of the college. So that's what I did. I got placed in Sunday World. Um, I freelanced there for years and years and years and eventually kind of got a staff job, I would say probably the very late 1990s. And then, yeah, that's kind of, that's the early days anyway, yeah. My own experience uh, is, much, sorry. Sorry, you might go ahead. <laughs> well done. My own experience is uh, similar to Esther's in that uh, in secondary school, I was only talking to Dan before we went live there. Uh, I'm from his neck of the woods and having been a fan of video games journalism and music journalism as a teenager I accidentally found myself in the editorial meeting for what was then the school magazine. Um, so I spent from second year to sixth year involved in various editorial um, functions there as well as writing and it was mostly just about writing about music that I liked and uh, being passed off as the editor by my teachers. Um, from there uh, the intention was to go into music uh, more so than journalism. I did a sound engineering course in the local FeedTech after also making the bags in my leaving cert. Um, and from there, getting into running gigs, uh, promoting gigs and various other functions led me down the path of blogging. Uh, I happened across a website that was functioning at the time called uh, dropd.ie, which would have been uh, you know, a, a fairly small but significant to Cork and Dublin's music scenes, uh, source, uh, source of listings, source of reviews and so forth. So I kind of got my my bones in news in music news reportage, uh, short form writing, and then later reviews, features writing, interviews, etc. cetera. Uh, that in turn led to opportunities with the likes of uh, RTE back when they were running their two tube block for, um, for, for tweens and teens, uh, which had a steady seam of online content from the various worlds of music and pop culture as well as the late lamented uh, Alternative Ulster magazine, which was the, the, the predecessor to the, mag to, the, to the magazine and blog currently known as The Thin Air. Um, spent some time there uh, and in between running gigs and writing about music, etc., uh, as well as doing some faffing around with sound art and community radio, uh, I ended up flagging a spot with the what was then called the Evening Echo. Uh, writing about music in print and my whole deal was that I had been a gig promoter 
I knew all the venues and I could uh, tick tack with the venues, but what they had coming up and help supply features, interviews, profile pieces, etc., for the downtown section of the Echo. So learning how to storytell for a wider audience as opposed to writing for specialist music journalism turned out to be a huge boon because I could take the lessons I applied and, um, to, and set about uh, and aside in human interest journalism, where I wrote for the Echoes Life and Women on Wednesday uh, sections, depending on uh, where the story, where editors felt the story uh, belonged best. Um, that in turn led to interviews over the years with the Irish Examiner uh, and starting with the Irish Examiner, first of all, on its news desk uh, in February of 2021, and then heading over to its features desk in about July or August of last year. Um, following the breakup of the then digital desk uh, as part of the Irish Examiner's ongoing uh, digital transformation. Well, uh, well, uh, <laughs> it's uh, suffice to say you've both you've both like uh, you've both cut like an impressive uh, cloth in your career for yourselves um, in like um, relatively such a short time. Like it's uh, really inspiring. Uh, I think like something something that uh, like. I'd like to bring up, like uh, you mentioned that, Mike. You mentioned it, and you mentioned it also, Esther. That um, that you like. I think like you were writing like since you were like like younger, like, and you've been involved in the, though at least you know, honing your skills and practicing for a while. Um, so they say that like, especially with like entertainment journalism, whether you know you're working in like writing about music or film, that uh, that it can be, you know, it can be quite niche. Like, and it's important that you have, you know, your own style of work and, you know, your own voice to your work. So, like, how would you go about advising anyone listening, you know, in discovering their unique voice when it comes to their writing or their podcasting or whatever they're doing? Mike, do you, you want to take that? Go? Yeah, go sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So, um, yeah, I mean, all of us grow up with different kind of frames of reference regarding journalism or critique. Uh, and to varying extents as well. Like myself and Esther would have come up at a time where uh, print music magazines, print film magazines would have been the predominant um, way and means of, of finding out things prior to, I suppose, the, 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 the mainstreaming of the internet in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, myself always kind of being a willing laggard, so to speak. Uh, I was always married to, to, the, to the video games magazines in the late 90s and as well as that in the early 2000s as I got into music I would have picked up the UK magazines and to a lesser extent print editions of Hot Press. Um, I suppose I learned to kind of weld the language that I was taking in via osmosis from those magazines uh, and how to kind of detach, not detach your own opinions but rather just learn how to kind of approach things from different perspectives um, and then, cause, then kind of uh, apply that to my own opinions but in terms of kind of how to find your own unique voice. I think those things like, you know, the, the media that you're already bringing in will have, you know, will have an impact, will have an influence, uh, whether or not you're kind of aware of it. But the most important thing is to listen to your kind of internal voice. Like, try, like, how does something make you feel when you, when you, when you take it in in the first instance, whether it's a film or whether it's music or whether it's, um, it's, it's literature or anything else? kind of listen to your initial gut reactions and then kind of pick it apart a little bit. Like, why am I feeling this way? Is this a matter of my frame of reference isn't up to speed on the genre? Is this a matter of I'm not familiar with it personally? Uh, is it a matter of this doesn't settle with me then? Just kind of feel your feelings initially, feel your gut feelings initially, and then kind of apply the critical aspect to it as well. But um, more important than anything else, write how you speak. Um, a unique voice, any of the unique voices that I've happened across in journalism over the last 10, 12 years have been from people that have kind of approached their subject with the same passion that they would as a fan. And if you go back all through the years, the legendary music journalists that have come and gone, it's all been people that have been voracious consumers of music, voracious consumers of gigs, uh, and they're coming at it from the perspective and the passion of people that have been doing it for so long. Um, even a bit before my time now, but in kind of doing my research on kind of the history of music in Ireland in particular. Hot Press's Bill Graham uh, is a real example of that in that he kind of really rolled from week to week by the seat of his plans, talking to these artists, talking to these musicians and kind of weaving little stories, uh, not just to be cleaving to the usual forms of feature storytelling, but really painting a picture. And that's something that, you know, you can take on in your own voice, but that's definitely something that I find, that, that I have found inspirational in recent years, uh, even though it might not immediately show up in a writing style, certainly in terms of conveying a, conveying an intention to the reader. Um, so yeah, just kind of think about 
how a subject makes you feel. Think about your kind of relationship to changes in the subject or how things are happening, etc. But most importantly, convey that in the manner that you would talk about it with passionate friends. Because ultimately, if you're reading for, or if you're writing for a blog or if you're writing for, you know, a, a student newspaper, you are reaching those people. You're reaching these people that have sought this publication and want to be spoken to on their terms. And then when it comes to uh, bigger media like regional um regional newspapers uh, etc you can kind of go into the the wider storytelling a little bit but kind of starting out solidify your voice make your voice distinct for me this is going to sound like bar me because i review films for a living and stuff but i've ne- i've always been less interested in my unique voice um i'm more interested in the voices of the people i'm writing about if that doesn't sound too crazy um, first of all, I think finding a voice, it's, it's slightly dodgy terrain, I think, because you'll be found out very quickly if you don't, as Mike says, write how you speak in print. I do think you'll be found out, and particularly on radio. Um, so if, if, if that means developing a persona or something, or if I'm reading that wrong, that's cool. But I would just be wary of that, I suppose, first of all. Um, yeah. For me, finding... Um, Finding the, the voice the person writing about, I think, goes into the, the fact that my background was in journalism. Like a, a lot of people now, I think, get into film writing through maybe media or film courses. Um, I certainly didn't have to have that sort of depth of knowledge or, or experience and I learned on the job, really. But for me, writing a film review or doing an interview with somebody, it's like a county council meeting. It's like who, what, why, where, when, how you write a b- report. There are elements that I call furniture that have to be in there. Um, You reference other filmmakers, you reference other films, and what you really are, I think, I've never liked the word critic. I call myself a reviewer. Um, I think there's too much elitism in film criticism as it is, and I'm not really interested in getting involved in that. Um, So what I see myself is that I am guiding the reader and over months and months and years, maybe the reader will trust me knowing what, but based on what I've known before. So that's what I'm speaking about, the importance of referencing other films and titles and the filmmaker and, you know, put, put all your knowledge there on the page, I suppose is what I would say. And that's that's my voice, I guess. I'm I'm, I'm very fact-based kind of writer. Um, I think people love discovering information about cinema. So why not give it to them if you're fortunate enough to, to have access to it, you know? Absolutely. Um, I think that just just kind of two things there that kind of came to mind in that respect and that number one, finding your own unique voice is distinct from having that voice override. Say if you're writing a feature, you're interviewing somebody, your voice frames what that person is telling you, your questions are structuring the piece, as I'm sure everybody here has kind of uh, found out to different extents. And absolutely, your your own unique voice, etc. shouldn't come to the expense of the interview subject. As Esther says, if you're writing for a publication over the course of months or years, et cetera, that voice and that frame, those framing devices that you develop over time become trusted and you build that element of trust with the reader as well. Uh, I had another point as well, but I'm after forgetting it, I'm sure. (laughs) I've always just loved capturing a sense of who people are as well. And and really to to lean back into even more to what Mike said at the start, uh, I like getting my interview subjects um, on the page in the way they speak I like getting a sense of who they are and a lot of people I interview would be actors or filmmakers and quite frankly they're sitting in a hotel room in the good old days we used to do face-to-face meetings and they are doing maybe 30 interviews that day they are bored to tears and my first purpose going in there is to actually liven up the room a bit and yeah. to actually give them a sense you know have a bit of crack be a little bit informal actually but also professional, it's, that's very important. And then just try and get a sense of who they are, because otherwise I'm just writing the same generic interview as everybody else. And they'll give you those same generic answers if they're bored to tears already. So it's a matter of kind of yeah. finding the thing that will crack them, so to speak, if they're bored, uh, to kind of um, lighten the atmosphere a little bit, as you say, uh, and then get the conversation flowing and get them going. Because it's one thing to talk to a band that you're really, really into yourself personally and are seeking to use the platform that you have to kind of get a bit of shine on them. It's quite another, as you say, Esther, to kind of walk into a hotel room to find a disinterested artist or to find a disinterested actor. They've pitched the, what are your influences and what are you doing next? Uh, about 30 times that day. So it's a matter of speaking to that aspect of the project that they love and kind of allowing themselves to kind of uh, get into it a little bit. 
or you'd be surprised as well what I find a lot um it's become so it's probably not as bad in music Mike I'm guessing but in film it's become really really sanitized um the interview process there's often people sitting in on the room with you um and what always amazes me is when you're prepping to do an interview everyone kind of ignores the person and the more famous the person is the more everyone ignores them and uh I remember Richard Gere, um, he, he was in for a diff and there was like so many publicists milling around and nobody was talking to him and he was sitting there getting mic'd up and I just went, how's things? You know, like, I think, don't, you know, don't be intimidated by fame, first of all, but also like show the same courtesy and respect to famous people as you would to anyone else, I guess. Yeah. Um, I asked him what he'd been doing earlier that day. It turns in, out he'd been down meeting Sister Stan. So I got a, I got an angle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's something that you learn, um, you know, whether it's in writing or whether you as a freelancer take on other Nixers and other things to kind of deepen your experience and kind of make the whole thing a little bit more sustainable is you happen across people that you admire or you happen across people that are famous for some odd reason. Um, as Esther says, they're just people doing a thing and the whole fame and infrastructure that kind of comes with that, et cetera, is a little bit of a construct. It's your job to cut past that. And as you said, uh, I had a similar circumstance when I was promoting gigs, uh, I was at a certain level there for a wee bit where I was taking on kind of big bands in a certain genre. Um, so promoting heavy metal shows, et cetera, I'd take on like mid-level names that were filling out clubs around uh, the UK and Ireland. So we talking to them and just kind of talking about, you know, how was, how, how was the journey over? What are you up to next, et cetera? How comes that next album and so forth? And just really kind of breaking down that whole thing, just professional, but interested. And that's the kind of key to kind of winning the trust of not only PRs and interviewees, but also an audience because they know that they're going to get something a little bit different when they open the paper. They're going to get the the, the human being behind the, the thing that's being plugged, you know? I think it's really important and it should be at the core of what you do because I've seen people respond to that. There's a very famous Irish actor I probably shouldn't name, um, but he was in a club one night many years ago and he saw some young one at the door and she was trying to get in with her friends and being the lovely person he is, um, got them admitted into the club yeah. and they bought him a pint to say thanks and they went about their way they were looking for nothing else and I remember him saying afterwards nobody's bought me a pint in years <laughs> like it just <laughs> never happens anymore and he was really touched by it you know so that's the thing I suppose find the human in everyone and, and you have a better chance of getting a decent interview as well out of that it's tough yeah. though like, because the, the system that's set up by publicists is, is designed to make it as synthetic and generic as possible. Because they've got a thing to plug. But by that same token, um, that that finding that human being, finding that story, etc., is absolutely key to making a reader care, too, because they've seen every other single segment on television or they've seen every other interview uh, down the line, uh, getting a little bit something extra out of them not getting something extra out of somebody like you're fucking ex mining them or exploiting them but just kind of talking to them etc and getting getting on a person on, on, a, on a personal level and talking about why they're doing what they're doing uh is key to kind of making somebody that would have picked up a paper or clicked through on something uh, and kind of getting them hooked within the first kind of 20 30 seconds uh maybe more maybe less um of reading because that's an unfortunate uh, part of uh, going from print to online is you know um, engagement is also now measured in terms of how long somebody stays on a story as well as how many people pick up the story in the first place so it's about kind of weaving that story and kind of keeping people in there once they're there you know I think that point about um, about you know engaging the audience is really good like and um, oh Christ what was I going to say <laughs> I had a really good voice happens oh, to no, us all. No, yeah, I remember what I was going to say um, the, the idea like you know that you should be per like you know trying to inject a bit of personality into the interview and trying to you know humanise it like is a really good point like those are some of my favourite interviews you know and interviewees when you know you can actually learn something about the person rather than you know it just being a copy paste answer like I remember like when I was in UCC I was the editor of the um, the student magazine Motley there and uh, one day one of my uh, one of our staff writers like he had reached out to a famous uh, like someone involved in the Irish entertainment industry I won't say who but uh, <laughs> uh, for an interview and got sent back you know the generic um, 
um, list of like questions and answers, like, and like we just said, we we just like I just refused to publish it because it, you know, it, it like you said, it feels synthetic. And if you know, I read the catches onto that, then they they're not going to trust you, and they're not going to come back. Like, um, but um, I think something that we really do need to address. Uh, you mentioned that it, you know, it's all about humanizing, you know, and putting you know the person into it. Given the fact that we haven't really seen anyone um, like in person for the past uh, 12 months that like because of the COVID-19 pandemic, that must really, you know, have placed a strain, you know, on your ability to do your job, you know, and you must have had to adapt it, you know, to writing about these things and, you know, talking to these people from a distance and, you know, socially isolated. So how difficult has it been working in the industry for this past year? And how have you adapted to working within mm. the, those um, restrictions? Well, I've been pivoting so much in the last year or so that I'm surprised I'm not twirling around in front of you here as we speak. Um, so my bread and butter, I, I like my do human interest features as well. Um, and I will that's just suppose on the last point, I would apply that not just to famous people, to anyone you interview, find a person there. Um, but like pretty much overnight, like I my, my interview access relies upon cinemas being open, films coming out. Um, and that was gone. It was it was gone overnight. Uh, I kind of just the first kind of month or two with the pandemic just floored me anyway. So I kind of happily just fell in with the lack of work, um, made the bloody sourdough like the rest of us. And, uh, but then I thought, no, I'm gonna have to start thinking here. So I really had to find all the distributors who were streaming online, you know, on platforms that we've only heard of maybe sometimes in the past year, find those, find interview access through those releases. Um, and it's been, yeah, I mean, I'd say my income's down about 40% in the, in the last year. Um, I'm fortunate in that I'm not exactly going anywhere, spending loads of money. I'm fortunate in that the hubby who's working downstairs from the Sunday World Sports pages to bed as we speak is still in full-time um, employment. And that was the plan, I suppose, when I went um, for a redundancy patch six years ago, it was looking pretty hairy in Dennis O'Brien's i at that time, um, now run by wonderful new uh, owners. But it was the, the idea was that one of us would step off and try and branch out and do all this stuff, which I, which I thought at the time would be copywriting. I didn't see myself having um, as much journalism left in me as I, I so far have found. But to answer your question, it's been, yeah, it's been challenging all the time though, you see. I think you just become really adaptable if you're a freelance journalist anyway. Um, and you're always problem solving. And you're always coming up with feature ideas in your brain. Um, that's kind of, yeah, it's, January was very hard, but again, I'm just going January in a pandemic, you know, if you're surviving, you're winning, you know? And I apply that to, to all you guys who are having to try and study on Zoom as well. If you're getting through the day at the moment, that's a win for me. That's the same in every sector. Uh, that's the same for all of us. Um, and that's been the big story of COVID-19. But it's interesting that you bring up the term, if you're surviving, you're winning. Because, um, like, obviously, having started in the examiner in February of last year, literally brought in right before the proverbial hit the fan, so to speak. Uh, it was one thing to learn a new role and to be in on a new role. It was quite another to take it home it was quite another to continue learning and continue forging those working relationships within a company etc while also you know uh, making your own dinner in your own oven or uh, like you said doing all the little things that you would do in lockdown as well and it's those little things that have kind of made the experience a, a little bit distinct but as you mentioned these can also be as as we've seen in the past coming up to a year now um People have relied on media a whole lot more for information, not only for information, but for, um, you know, distraction, for, 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 for a place to go to read about the things that they love, to stay in touch with the things that they love. And in that respect, the great story that all feature writers are telling to different extents, whether you're in the Examiner or the Echo or the Tabloids, uh, is of people surviving. And if you're surviving, you're winning. Um, we talk about how an earnest voice uh, sparingly sprinkled uh, throughout an interview can lead to a long-term building of trust and we've been very very lucky in that respect that with music um, obviously live gigs shut down so immediately the whole thing of you know talking to bands that are coming to town shortly given you know a page to that band you really want to talk to that you know are going to be playing a small venue and then balancing that with 
you know, going shoulders to the wheel on festival spreads or what have you. Uh, that was all gone immediately. So we immediately pivoted almost without thinking about it. The, the, uh, the feature ideas and the pitches went from such and such is coming to town to such and such is doing a live stream gig. So there's that element of destination programming and appointment programming already that we had to get in ahead of, so to speak, as you often do when you're, when you're writing entertainment features. So while the model just kind of shifted more to kind of staying at home, staying safe, um, the story still had to be told. Uh, artists are doing their own thing. They're doing their own thing in already difficult circumstances that are made somehow even more um, fearsome by uh, the threat of a global pandemic, uh, erasing their traditional income or traditional remaining income streams. But from that, we managed to kind of talk to the different record shops in town about how they were coping with the crisis. We managed to talk to the venues as they were setting up for their home stream or for their streaming uh, gigs uh, in and around Christmas time, etc. And just kind of talking about the various conditions that you know, that they happen across, you know, the different roles of filmmakers, the different roles of venue bookers in that respect, and getting to explore and talk to people uh, kind of outside the, the traditional treadmill of band is on the road. Cool. you got a new album coming out. What was that like to put together, etc.? Oh, cool. You're celebrating this anniversary or, you know, you're new on the road, etc. And you supported this big band. You know, it, it, it's been a chance to kind of get out and escape that kind of... Um, that the, the the usual furniture that you'd arrange um, a piece about and truly you'd hope anyway uh, allow a, an artist or a musician or a person uh, to come through on the page. Um, it hasn't made any things any it hasn't made things any more or less difficult for me at least. I'm thankful to be in a in in a full time position after uh, nearly a decade or over a decade of uh, being a journeyman freelancer. Uh, so I really can't complain in that respect. Uh, the challenge has just kind of changed and shifted with the territory. And that's the change for all of us, really, is just to kind of react and respond to things while continuing to engage people where they are. I had a, an unexpected benefit as well that I, I didn't see coming, which is kind of fun. Um, in the normal sanitised hotel room, rush the, the, the journal in, rush the journal out, rush in the next journal situation, you know, time, time you got to spend with actors and filmmakers and creators was getting cut all the time. You'd be lucky yep. in the end to get 15 minutes. But now that that's all stopped, I find I'm talking to actors and I can't get them off the bloody phone because they're in quarantine <laughs> somewhere. Uh, they're in quarantine somewhere waiting to get um, clearance to start filming. And they're looking at the four walls. They want to climb up the four walls. Yeah. And uh, kind of once the summer kicked in and, and production activity started again, that was a funny thing for me. Jessie Buckley this year, like what a year she's having. And she's a lovely, yeah. lovely person. Um, but in a hotel room situation, I would not have got 45 minutes this year with Jessie Buckley. It just wouldn't happen, you know? Yeah. So, Huge okay. uptick in transcription times as a result of these yes. extended chats. <laughs> Which is fine if you're on shift time, etc. Because obviously there's like the race against time to get stuff filed in for time, etc. But if you're on a freelance basis, that again allows you to spend more time considering your next uh, step or considering, you know, what way, the, what shape the piece eventually takes. Because you can go down tangents, you can include tangents if you can, etc. Or if you're stuck to a word count, etc. You can make reference to it. So, like again, it's 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 adaptation and uh, and talk and 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 feeling it out. And, and, and having mentioned transcription there, can I tell you something that 25 year old me wish I knew? Go on. O online transcription services are your friend. They're your friend. Trinch is great. Uh, they're not a, they're not 100 percent accurate. You're looking maybe you have to rethink how you transcribe. I guess you're not writing from scratch. You're correcting heavily. Um, yeah. And document heavy in errors, but they, they are really good. And I'm using one. Trinch was fine for a while. Um, I'm using one now called uh, Otter, which is a tenor a month uh, for unlimited amount of transcriptions. And if you end up doing a lot of interview stuff, based stuff, or, or if, you know, that sort of thing, it really is a, a, a worthwhile tool. It will give hours back to your day. And it's, it's funny to see the ones that come out nearly 100% clear as well. They're always theatre actors who yeah. are used to shouting back to the stalls and really clear, like Kenneth Branagh. Even even Artemis Fowl was spelled correctly in the transcript, you know. Wow. So. <laughs> How much but, of that yeah. is machine learning, though? I think it's probably some of it. I find it's getting better, or maybe I'm just getting more used to working that way. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
definitely worth looking at though guys and a lot of them uh, a lot of them give you free trials as well they give you free hours to get you on board initially I'd be relatively old school in that respect, just in case something gets misinterpreted or gets misspelled. That comes from subbing my own copy to a, s a certain extent before um, submitting it as a freelancer. But definitely worth taking a look if uh, deadlines are piling up for sure. Oh, but, and you ha you absolutely have to go through it. I mean, you just you just play the recording and just watch as the words come up, and, and you have to watch it like a hawk to to make sure that, you know all the quotes are correct and all the facts are correct. And then, how is it uh, with accents? Oh God! Oh. It's quite good with cork, actually. <laughs> hey, um, Sorry. it's uh, it's pretty good. There, who was there was someone they couldn't understand at all. I'm trying to remember the accent, but I can't remember who it was. But I do find it's it's probably a bit of machine learning, a bit of me adapting. Um, but it's rarely an issue now. It's definitely I like I'm a slow writer. I, do, I know other people can knock out an interview quickly, but I could take all day transcribing a long interview. You know. There's nothing wrong with being a detail-oriented writer either in that respect, because that goes back to building that trust with editors and with a readership as well. True. That's what that's what copy subs would say about about me. I think you'll be waiting, but when you get when you get it, it'll be perfect. <laughs> I must say now, I, I I've like when when it's time for your copy to go online for the examiner now. Um, and this is a compliment to yourself. When it comes through from Des, it's already been through subbing on a bunch of occasions, but I've never had an issue with your copy coming in as well, enriching it, embedding trailers, etc. It all flows well in that respect. So oh, uh, definitely you. worth looking at other in that respect. Thank you. I'm not, I, you know, I'm joking aside about you'd be waiting for my copy, lads. Deadlines, don't, just don't miss deadlines. Don't. Subs and produ production desks, they just don't have the time or resources um, to be getting let down anymore and it would really affect your, your reputation as a freelance journalist if you become known as the person who misses a deadline. Especially oh. now. Especially now, yeah. In that way it sounds like uh, freelance journalism is almost like college work. <laughs> you Absolutely, miss, you know, you're just in college for the rest of your life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well that's, that's comforting. <laughs> uh, the way you're talking, you know, like, um, you know, getting access to, you know, these interviewees, you like, like, it really is that, like, one of the most important things of journalism is relationships, you know, like building these relationships with, you know, potential interviewees. Um, if you're like on the film uh, festival circuit, like the organizer of the festival or a gig organizer. And like, but I think like uh, one, like one, one thing like a lot of people struggle with, you know, when they start now is how do you know how do you build these relationships how do you like get your foot in the door with these people um how do you pitch your idea how do you i guess like how just how do you build a good working relationship with someone when you know you're trying to get started in this industry you know and you're just you know you're working as a freelancer and trying to get your name out there you want to start this one Esther? yeah go for it um See, I, like my perspective is kind of an odd one in that I kind of took live events management and starting in, in blogging at roughly the same time. I was about 19, 20 years of age. So on a local basis, I was au fait with all of the venues and who was running what. I was talking with other promoters at the time. So, you know, you, you, you develop a relatively good relationship with people just in terms of being in the trenches of running gigs, uh, trying to get people interested in bands that are coming to town or helping to develop some sort of ongoing narrative of regular gig uh, in town around the local scene, which for many music journalists is kind of their bread and butter when they get started is their regular gig goers. They're writing about their experiences and they're telling their long term story of you know their, their favorite genre, their favorite music scene or their their, their local scene, etc. Uh, and that stands to their ability to tell a long term story for a publication and continue to build trust with readers uh, going forward. But for me, with um, that, that kind of put me at an advantage when I came knocking on various magazines doors or with the with the echo initially was I kind of done the legwork in building those relationships by way of having brand shows and having empathy for people that were trying to run gigs. I kind of had an insight as to what a promoter, how a promoter would benefit best from a story going into a paper, what aspect of an artist that they're trying to promote and trying to get across to a specialist audience. Uh, would reflect best on their live experience and whether that was okay you've got an album coming up etc and you're touring this album what was it like to put it together what was it like to create it and what can people expect from it in terms of the live environment and whether it's in the round of the spot being faunic or someplace like cypress avenue or or uh, the cork opera house etc it, it's it, it's a question that 
is universal bordering on generic, but yet you'll get wildly different answers that are relevant to so many different situations in that respect. So don't lose sight of that in that respect. Uh, if I were starting today, having not run gigs, my whole deal would be to ascertain who's running gigs, who's running venues, etc., and kind of introduce myself. Uh, just go, right, my name is Mike, and I'm writing for X, or else I have started up a little blog for myself. That's that that's another kind of advantage you can have is setting up a WordPress just to kind of host these on your own and kind of slowly build up a portfolio for yourself on the kind of hyper local basis as well and slowly but surely like just by the natural course of things you'll happen into the smaller promoters and then the bigger promoters likewise PRs will start kind of grabbing a hold of you if you've got a particularly active blog because PRs will want you know a place to put their their, their startup uh, clients so to speak their, their, their clients that are kind of starting from scratch or from from, from from not a position of advantage uh, in the music business and it's it, it's 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 in the course of you being a free being a features journalist wanting to give people a fair ear about their artistic processes about the experiences that have driven them to create and about where they want that creativity to take them in life uh, in the same way that you build your your, your trust with your editors that you can create uh, engaging copy that lets people into the artist's life a little bit uh, so too do you build those um do you build those relationships with with festival pr pr promoters, with gig promoters, etc.? Um, because you're coming at it from the right place. You're coming at it from the point of I want to talk and I want to tell this story because ultimately, the more people that get hooked on a on an artist's story, or the more people that kind of get a deep dive on an artist they maybe would have only heard about from seeing a gig, a gig poster around town or a festival poster on a billboard someplace. Uh, you know, obviously, it helps their cause. So uh, it's it's sticking with it. It's looking it's 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 knowing in yourself where to go to speak about uh, a certain genre of music or a certain genre of film and developing those relationships with your editors developing that you, that relationship with that editor's readership that you can then turn around and go you know not that you can put out results in terms of favorable publicity but rather that you can tell a compelling story and you want to tell that compelling story and you're telling it from that frame of reference uh, in a way that kind of hooks people and gets people engaged um to the end goal, which is, you know, whatever gig or festival yourself. But that was just kind of my empathy of kind of being in the trenches and running around, running gigs, putting up posters myself, doing the catering, handling management, you know, uh, talking to tour managers on the night, all, all of that business, etc. That all kind of informed my desire to want to talk about a wide variety of things that were happening on my local scene and to continue, luckily, what was the, the, the Echoes uh, downtown sections ongoing remit which was to keep people um looped in on what was happening in the local music community yeah for me cultivating relationships and maintaining relationships has been i think probably the single most important thing in terms of having a successful career for me absolutely has helped me survive freelancing um has helped me survive the last year for sure uh, and that works both ways. That works for both the people you're writing about and the people you're writing the copy for, um, i.e. the not just the readers, but the page editors and the people. And it's just all the nice stuff, lads. It's just all the nice stuff. Reliability, honesty, tact, um, doing what you're going to say you say you're going to do, you know. Uh, if you're going into an awkward territory with an actor, you have a little chat about that. Um you know, and you respect the person, you respect the person. And I think particularly with Irish talent, I have cultivated some fantastic relationships over the years. And I've been able to kind of go in the last year, I know that guy hasn't got a film coming out, but does he owe me a favour? <laughs> and then, you know, giving him a call and saying, do you want to do something on the arts in crisis? And they go, yeah, you know, so it's all of that. Um, I think Irish actors as well, they just... We just have the most amazing range of talent here in this country at the moment. It's a very exciting time to be writing about film and TV here. Yeah. But they have a BS radar, I think, as well, and especially when they're talking to journalists at home. And they talk to each other and they know who the correctness person is and to watch them at the interview. You know, it's a village for the acting community here as well as for anyone else in Ireland. Also, I think they expect you to show up. That, you know, if someone like Brendan Gleeson's gone and done the rounds, um, of kind of, you know, beige interviews in the US and he's coming back to do a day's press in Dublin. He wants to have the crack, but he'll, he'll expect you to show up as well. He wants decent, proper questions and have a proper 
intense conversation, you know, uh, one of my favourite interviewees in, in that regard. He's, he's wonderful. Try try pegging a 15 minute slot on Brendan Gleeson. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, yeah, relationships. Also not burning the people who are um, releasing films, who often have the tankless job when, when it comes to working with journalists, because we see them as a barrier maybe to doing more of what we want to do. I think you have to work with people like that. Uh, because in film, particularly, it's the distributors and PR people who decide if you're being put forward for um, interviews with talent or not, you know, so you, you can't burn them either. And I think, I know from having a few friends who'd be working in film distrib distribution, the worst thing they can read in an interview was the PR told me not to ask the star about this. Um, and I think it's absolute cop out. Whenever I see it in an interview, I think it's like, well, like you're having your cake and eating it there because one, you're going, I didn't ask them the, the question. And then you're blaming somebody else for you not asking the question. So I just, I shake my head when I see that in an interview. And particularly, it's always put, put as some sort of important investigative journalism um, remark, you know, which it isn't at all. It's a cop out. As opposed to a jokey aside, you bring up two very interesting points there as well. And Dan, I know you're going to kind of ask a little bit about how to kind of... Um, Again, I'm, I'm asking a question that a PR told me not to ask, but um, in terms of you wanted to discuss kind of how to deepen one's own experience and kind of get a better depth and breadth of experience. If you're writing about a subject and if you're writing about a subject from having had the perspective of someone that's tried playing music, uh, maybe, you know, talk about, or maybe get into various other roles within the music industry to kind of uh, expand your, your your knowledge and your understanding and your empathy for those different roles, because you're going to be going to people, uh, whether it's PR or whether it's even just volunteering at a festival, whether that's stewarding, handling merchandise, running gigs, uh, being a sound engineer, all of those things will stand to you because it'll understand, it'll, it'll expand your empathy of what different people are doing at different times, you know, whether it's their off time for creating, et cetera, that you know that as a creative yourself, that you've, that, that you've been in the trenches and you know what's happening as well. So for any young entertainment journalist, if you found a field that you love already, uh, really throw yourself into it and volunteer for what you can when, when it's safe to do so again, obviously, when festivals are running back, when small gigs are running again, or even volunteer to organize small gigs in the, in, in the small venues that, 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 that surface after the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, wherever it is that you're, that you're residing. But there's the other thing as well, Esther, and it's something that I kind of learned more so, not so much with 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 um, with print journalism because it's quite obviously it's quite literally in black and white what you're interviewing them for or how you're going to go about it. But I spent two years there um, just before the pandemic with Red FM uh, hosting their local music podcast, Red on Red, and I found that a lot of the people that I would bring in for podcast interviews into a studio in Red FM out in Bishopstown. It, the context is different for them than chatting to you down the phone about what they're doing next because they know themselves there's questions they know themselves that um, that that a, that a writer is talking to them etc and it's in their best interest to give kind of concise answers or give kind of in-depth answers that the writer themselves can then pass into a word count whereas with a podcast you know despite the, the the explosion of popularity in the genre in the middle of the pandemic a lot of people weren't necessarily sure what they were in for compared to a, a, a print interview or, or, or a blog interview or even social media Q&A. Um, so I learned the hard, the, the, the hard way to put people at ease in advance by kind of explaining them what the context of this piece was, where it was going, what the story you're telling is, um, and how you stand to benefit along the way. Not in a way that's kind of, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, but in terms of, here's what I'm gonna ask you about. Not sending questions in advance, but just at the start of the conversation, here are the beats, here are what we're gonna talk about as well. And you know, this is where it goes out. So in terms of going through those questions and being respectful, being professional and kind of telling people where this interview is going to land uh, can go a long, long way to, uh, toward kind of helping disarm people uh, or, or kind of getting people on page. The other thing as well, um, and it's something that's kind of come to mind now in particular. Uh, in, in recent times, uh, ask people the preferred pronouns, uh, just kind of be respectful, etc. If if you feel unsure, etc., about how somebody is presenting themselves, ask the preferred pronouns because that's going to go a long way toward establishing trust um, where certain people are concerned. There's a few very simple tools as well. And I learned just this in journalism school back in the day. I remember the lecturer telling me, um, if someone's not used to being interviewed in particular, um, you know, because we talked about kind of 
cutting through the barriers and one end of things. But as, as I said, I also do human interest features. I, I interview people who are victims of serious crime, who've lost to their children, and they've never done an interview before. So I would spend a bit of time in that situation, getting the spelling of their name right, asking them as the, their spouse have the same surname as them, asking their kids' ages, and it just gives them a sense of confidence in the person who's driving the car. Um, but also, if, if I'm interviewing someone who's kind of maybe had suffered a trauma, I will ask them, what do you hope to achieve from this piece? And I think it just gives people a bit of currency, a bit of ownership about what they're setting out to do. It also makes them think about what they want to say. Um, so just just throwing them in for people, who, you know, for what it's worth for people who aren't used to being interviewed or may have never been interviewed before and don't understand the process. I think that's those are useful little tools. Okay, perfect. Uh, and the, 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 there's some really useful advice, and I um, um, I hope that student, any student journalist listening, like uh, took a, a lot away from this uh, uh, um, this discussion. We're coming up to the hour now, so um, uh, we, I'm just gonna leave it with one, one last question, a very quick one, like, and it's just a bit of fun because I love uh, torturing people with it whenever I interview them, but. Uh... Um, <laughs> it like uh, just like really quickly now, like it. Um, if you could interview anyone living or dead, who would it be and why? <laughs> oh, God. I think this week it has to be Christopher Plummer. Yeah. It, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, he's just, yeah, when people die now, I go, damn, one got away, you know? Um, so, yeah, he would have been lovely. And I was talking to an, an actor who knows him well last night, and that I can't tell you any of the stories, but he seems no. to be quite a character. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, there's loads. I could be here all day, honestly. Sometimes it can be just nice to hit a groove with a really well-known Irish actor though, that you've interviewed mm. a dozen times before and just put on that lovely sloppy will jumper again and know it's going to be a great experience, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, it's the environment, I think, that you you get to interview people in rather than... I mean, Robert De Niro, for example, like a lot of people would wish to interview him, but he remains the most monosyllabic into like people have tried to bring like very talented um journalists have tried to break them and they haven't so it's it's partly who you want to interview but it's partly also what you know is it going to be a worthwhile experience um interviewing them and i can't think of a better one on both counts maybe than, than christopher Plummer. oh sorry my apologies uh <laughs> connection drop um yeah uh esther much like yourself i have a whole list of people uh, a whole uh, bucket and post bucket list of people that i would have loved to interview and i could be here all day shouting on about it um i think though in terms of people that have passed away lately i would be kicking myself forever more that i never had a chance to interview the rapper mf doom just in terms of his um his articulacy as a rapper just in terms of his great um pop culture reference he was a real scholar of movie cinema of comic books of pro wrestling of video games and that came through in his work he would reference them um frequently in his work and that's something that i would love to i would have loved to have sat down and kind of that, that's a whole conversation that i would have loved to have mined so um yeah hearing all the stories thereafter the the nile or nine podcast talk to a couple of irish people that had dealt with him in previous years as promoters and as journalists etc uh, and he seemed like a, a, a really nice individual to have dealt with once he got past the mystique of the man in the iron mask. Um, so in that respect, uh, that's that's definitely something I'd be very regretful of as a fan of his work that I never had the chance to, to talk to him. Otherwise, uh, just for the sheer impact that he had on my life, um, I would have loved to have spoken to Kurt Cobain. Uh, that's the thing I've had now for about 20 years at this stage. <laughs> and I don't think that's going to abate any time soon. Uh, living. Uh, Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine, although I, I suspect that he would be very, very difficult to crack as a journalist. I imagine so. Uh, well, uh, that's about all time we have for today, uh, for this panel today. I want to say thanks, thank you to Mike and Esther for uh, coming and hanging out with us and uh, just, you know, talking to us for the past hour. It's always lovely, you know, um, when, you know, people involved in the industry just, you know, come and give back and, you know, talk to uh uh, people who are interested in getting involved uh thanks very much guys i uh, hope you enjoyed the panel and um yeah have a lovely afternoon thank thanks you for having everyone us. hope Bye. i wasn't too much of a motor mouth <laughs> not a bother